I am 274 hard and I'm committed to seeing that love and nurture and resilience of Ōtara be expressed throughout the whole of our country. This podcast is proudly supported by the Ōtara Network Action Committee, ONAC, community owned, community driven and community led. Kia ora once again, welcome to the We Otara podcast, uh, sponsored by ONAC, the Otara Network Action Committee. I almost stumbled on that, Will. <laughs> awesome group of people, awesome, just fantastic people. If you ever get a chance to see them, um, they are starting up their meetings at the end of every month on Wednesdays uh, down at the Powerhouse. So if you see... Uh, down by Love Grove, so if you see our, our local hero, uh, Sally Paya, say give him a lovely high five and a hello from me and from us here at um, We Are To Our Podcast. Now, to, to our official business at hand, we have large presidents with our new new guest. He is the um, he is the mayoral candidate for the United States of Auckland, <laughs> <laughs> and and former mayor of Otar is uh, <laughs> Professor Collins. Say hello. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Vinny. And it's good to be here. It's nice to be in a relaxed studio like this. So I really appreciate <sighs> being your guest today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, for our lovely viewers, please. Talk about yourself, or explain about yourself your 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 humble beginnings in your journey from here to where you are now. So I was born at Middlemore Hospital, and my parents uh, lived in a state house just off Preston Road. So we sat off on Featherston Crees, and then when I was at, by the time I got to school, we had moved around the corner down the road to Preston Road, the amazing, the phenomenal Preston Road that's really popular out south. And that's where I lived for most of my life. So I went to East Tamaki Primary School, uh, Ferguson Intermediate, and then uh, I dabbled with uh, Auckland Grammar for a little while and then came back and finished off at Tangaroa like yourself and enjoyed it, loved it in Otara. Yeah, shout out, shout outs to Ferguson, you know, much love out uh, to Fergie and ET and TC as well. <laughs> well, how was it like in TC? Like, I, I remember my years at TC, it was all about um, no mufti. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Teachers, teachers will stand out in front of the gate checking uniform. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It was it was it? I'm because I'm, I'm about a thousand years older than you, and so <laughs> it wasn't quite like that when I was at school. They check our uniform, and it was those days that we were we had changed the uniform. So we went from a grey to the black, white. And the blue sweater, yeah, right. so it was a, probably, that was the uniform that you got um, to. So yeah, and school was good. I had really good teachers. They were really invested in us. Uh, it was, a, I remember it being a challenging time, especially I was at, um, at TC during the late 80s. And, you know, there were lots of, there was lots of hardship around those times, but really close families. And a lot of the people that I went to school with are still my friends today. Awesome. You would have been growing up with like, with like warrior player, um, Jeremy Jeremy Susi and all them, right? Yeah, yeah. So you name the people who went on to great sports things and I don't do sports. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) We, um, I I wasn't as quick as Jerry. We were the same class. We're the same age. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so Jerry Susi was in, in our class. We went to university together there are only about four of our class of 17 that went to university and Jerry was one of them and then he went on to hire things uh, with the Warriors um, played really well and I just hung around university because I enjoyed it so much that I thought I'd just stay for another 15 years <laughs> no I understand that I did that with MIT I, st- I stuck around for six <laughs> years and then ended up having an IT job <laughs> there you go yeah well I want to go on to um, to, to AUT and uh, uh, AU Auckland University um, to just remembering the conversation that you had when you when you came to talk to us, um, student council members, can you explain to us about the process of establishing something like that in the student body about like uh, governance and, and student council in, in Auckland Uni? Because that wasn't heard of in a, for a while, right? Like it had to be yeah. established. Yeah, it was new. And so the Pacific Island um, Student Council, we were called then, we were trying to get spaces on campus. And so now it's something that's really common when you talk about Whare Pacifica, you talk about 
specific student space or a, a space, for a common area for students. It's much more common. We know about it now. But back in those days, we were trying to find spaces for us. And that was something that we worked really hard on. We got all of our clubs together. So at university, we had like the Fijian students, Tongan Students Association, Samoan students, Pacific Students for Christ. So all of these groups got together and said to the Students Association, let's have a space for Pacifica students. And it's now called Olangiatea Moana, and it's the Pacific student space. And I think it's a really good place for people to relax, to chill, but it gives us a, a place where we can connect together and then think about what our challenges are and what the issues are that we'd like people to advocate for. Absolutely, absolutely. And and I, I, I worked in that area in tertiary, you know, yeah. and going to like the big fauna out in, in Otago two years ago yeah. and listening to our, you know, institutes finally establishing the, the Pacifica side of support, having the, the, the groups of um, – uh, having Samoan, Fijian oh, yeah, groups, yeah. and it was amazing because you can see the number of pockets out in those different institutes now becoming to picking it, but keeping those yeah, core yeah. values. Yeah. It's important. So going in lines with that, um, we see our we see us in Auckland as a big family, as a big community. What in, what are your thoughts now when you see our young people out there who are still trying to find their way through their own their own aspects in life? Yeah, I, I acknowledge that being young is cool, but it's also a challenge. And there's lots of things that you're exposed to. There's lots of ideas you're dealing with. You're thinking about, oh, you know, there's lots of questions you're asking. You want to hang out with your friends. You're thinking about what do I want to do when I finish school? Go on to do a course or work? Do I want to travel? Hey, who might be my life partner? Hey, I, that was the one reason I went to university was because I knew I might find someone who might I might be able to pay to marry me, and she did. <laughs> uh, she made that error, and now she put she has the ring on her finger. So I, when I think of young people, I think they're they're working or or navigating through all of those things in life now. And I just think it's important that we're there to support them, that they've got older people like me who are around because what we know from youth development is that there's four kind of key areas that influence the the social environments of a young person. It's your peers, your family, your community, and then your school and your workplace. And it's, if we treat it like a chair, hey, like there's four legs to a chair, and if all of those things are strong, all of those areas are strong, then that's going to be one really strong young person. And the challenge is, if there are areas that aren't so strong, then how do we support and heal and nurture those parts so that they can be strong, so that the young person can be strong? Absolutely. And it's always that core, you're going back to core foundations. Yeah. You know, you, you want to strengthen those core foundations. Yeah. And then you go, and then we, we see we see all of this, and we we love to see it. But then you go back to our our homes, mm-hmm. um, especially in Otara. And it's, when, when I say Otara, because I I lived there mm-hmm. my thirty one years, I've I've seen young people growing up, and then and you have that you have that, and I'm sorry to say, but you have this sort of divide yeah. where you have people who do succeed, and you have mm-hmm. people who don't who sort of need that support. Yeah. And it's and we do need people like you, yourself, Professor Collins, because you're 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 a standing beacon of what we can do yes. and our full potential. So when when it comes to that, how do we give that light to those who need that light? Because it's just it's a it's it's always they don't see this they see this tunnel vision. Yeah. So how do we give that light to them? You, you ask questions harder than when I go to the TV interviews. Look, th- th- there's, these are really complex issues, eh? and I think the first thing I, I, I think about things now with my young girls, eh? with my daughters, and I try my best to facilitate it so that their their interests are nurtured. And whilst I remember when my wife was pregnant, our first uh, child, and we used to pray and we'd ask the Lord to, you know, give my wife a, a healthy pregnancy. And you, because I was raised when I was raised, I would just say, Lord, thank you. That's going to be my doctor. The next one will be a lawyer, because that's what we were taught was a hey, this a measure of success. And yet now I I look at my daughter's interest. She loves to sing. She's artistic. She loves to run around. Loves her sport. And I don't think she's going to be a doctor. I think she's 
who's going to be a real designer, and really creative person. And I'm learning that it's my job as her dad to really support her, to encourage her to get to know people in those industries and allow her to express her artistic creativity in, in many ways. I think that's how we want to be with young people, the, the light or the torch that you're talking about is how do we lift or keep our eyes lifted? And I think there's real challenges to do that. But like you say, they've got to see people who are a little bit older than them in position so that they believe that those positions are reachable for them too. Often, remember, um, I think it's Christian Schmidt, Christian, I can't remember his surname, but he did MTV, for, uh, we studied together. And Chris says that um, in order to be it, you've got to see it. And I think that's one of the key ideas for our young people, that when they see you succeeding, they look at someone like you and they think, well, wow, he's doing a podcast, he's um, committed to the community and supporting the community. When pe our young people see that in action, I think they make a connection between what's possible because it's collapsing the distance between what's possible, what's their reality now and how they get there. And I think you and I are that bridge to help them to believe that they can do it. Absolutely. And it, it comes back down to what, you know our, our, our growing our experience. Like you mentioned our parents. Yeah. My father, who was a cabinet maker for over 50 oh. years, he worked out in a factory in, in East Tamaki. He would make cabinets. And uh, I, I said, he, he said to me once, he goes, I don't want you to work here. Mm. I don't want you, like your brother's working here with me. Yeah. I want you to be who you want to be, son. And I and I, and I think of that. But then you hear mom going, you should make the money for the family. You support the family. Yeah, yeah. It's the duality of things. Yeah. So when you see kids at our age who's currently have to either live with what they have with their talents, which is great, or they – have to grow up as twice twice as fast in their in their environment to become who they need to be. Yeah. Um, what sort of message you if you so let's just say I'm a parent right in front of you, and I'm coming up to you. I do not know where I where I want my child to be. What sort of advice as a parent to a parent could you give to that parent? Yeah, I'd, I'd begin by reminding parents that they know their kids. If anyone knows their kids the best, I think it's parents. It's one of the things we do a lot. When I used to do teacher education, it's I, I always reminded parents that they know the kids well. You know what interests them. You know what upsets your child. You know what excites them. You know the food that they love to eat. You know when they should be in bed or when they're tired. I can see it now with my youngest daughter. You know, she starts tripping over and banging into things but when she's tired you you recognize those things and my first encouragement to parents is you you've got that information and don't feel like you've got to turn to other people to know what you already know our job is to support and encourage them to say my my child is like this and the next step is to say, what do you need to support you in helping your child to flourish? And that might be after school programs, going along to the homework centres. And I think that's what's really key is a lot of our parents have a lot of the resource, but we discount it. And we think, oh, no, nah, we're from Otara. It's, it's better over here. It's never better. My, I, I, I talked earlier when I said I dabbled with Auckland Grammar because I went to Ferguson and at the end of my years at Ferguson, they said, you should go to a school outside of Ōtara because you're a bright boy. And so my parents, being good Samoan parents, just thought, well, let's listen to the teachers. We applied to five schools. No one accept me, accepted me except grammar. So I think they must have made a typing error and said <laughs> yes a rather than no. And I went there for two weeks and it didn't quite work out. Ended up at TC and loved it at TC. And I think that's what our parents need to know, their support around them and that together Hey, we know what the kids love and we can do it. I, I don't want people to feel like they're out of touch. And But I acknowledge that we don't have a lot of money or a lot of resource around the house. So let's find ways to support all of our families. Absolutely. Going back to what you were saying with Auckland Grandma, I, you know, I had, I had friends who were bright, mm -hmm. you know, leave because they were, you know, they were told that, oh, you're at a higher level than what we can cater but at the same time, as a school, you should be catering to our children's needs. Yeah. Like, you, this is just my opinion. You're sort of just fobbing it off to another school. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. oh, I don't think you, you'll, you'll be too fast for our kids who yeah. are here. 
but you should use that example to raise up the other children yeah. not put them on a pedestal but just go have him have them working amongst the group of kids who are struggling in things like this kid knows what he's doing. Let's follow his example. Yeah. It, it might be, you know, hey, I know a fisso. Yeah. He's a year 13. He's a senior. Let's get him to mentor someone that's, you know, who needs the mentoring. Mm-hmm. And then it goes back to just very basic, very homegrown stuff in Otara. And we're very that, that, that group of people where we find our problems, well, issues really and then we go okay let's see how we can deal with it and then you have people like like Sully Pai yeah, Pai, yeah. Um, rest in peace Anava, yeah. you know who just in the forefront just goes okay I see this with these young yeah, people yeah. let's make them into beautiful things yeah. so people other yeah. people can see well said yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean with that said, you know, you, you're, you're stepping forward into big shoes. I remembered, I remembered you stepping forward as a council member and I read that article. I was like, bruh, we got ourselves a brother and in, in, into council and I was so proud of you. It was just like, what was, what was, what was running through your minds when they went, Officer Collins, you are now a council member of Auckland. What that year, what went through your mind? Yeah, there's lots that goes through your mind. I remember when when we won and you get the result. They they ring you and then it all goes online as live as as live can be. And I was home. We chose to wait for the announcement at home with my wife. And back then, I'd only had the one daughter. And we it was really moving. Eh? And we didn't think so much about how cool it was because it was it was it was a real honour. We thought a lot about the the travel and the journey of our parents, our ancestors really, to New Zealand, to Auckland, and what it meant for my parents. You know, my father passed away about 14 years ago, and so he wasn't there when um, when I got into office, and nor was my wife's mum. She had passed away just a few years earlier too. And so the other people we think of, the other ones who we strive for because we take their memory, their being with us into today and so yeah that, that was one of the things going through my mind that we want to be the the embodiment of the hopes of our ancestors and that's what I think is really important for all of us and yeah, it's a public role so obviously people know about it publicly but I think in all of our roles we've got to acknowledge that we are that embodiment that our ancestors I don't know that they foresaw us being here today but they must have seen something because they travelled through the Pacific. Then we came from Samoa or Tonga to here, and now we're being part of the fabric of Auckland to take it to the next level. So, yeah, there's real pride, there's real humility in, in uh, getting these positions, but it also comes with great responsibility. Absolutely. And one of the things I think of a lot now is my daughters and the next generations, the, my girls friends at school and the kind of world we're building for them and whether there'll be a lot of compassion and generosity in this world or whether we'll leave them with a world that's probably as divided as perhaps what we came through yeah. and so those are the things that you know I, I, I think through during the day and I walk in, in this life because you know in politics because I think that we have a call to be a voice as well everyone's different everyone does their thing you might be doing IT I'm in politics whatever it is we've got to be thinking about what does the future hold for everyone and how do we lift everybody so that we're all part of at that table we had a very deep conversation in the beginning and it was and it's and it leads into it leads into a, a lot of important things especially in the in terms of the of just your beliefs and whatnot so when we look ahead we look ahead to the future our future looks nothing to compare to what we saw in and now in our minds in the, when we were children so when you see our tamariki, our children, look towards the future, what things in your mind you want you want to help them grow into? What what things do you want to see? Yeah, I, I want to see them believe. There's a bit of research that Linda Smith did. She's a professor, Linda Smith, 
And she said her research in her earlier part of her career looked at how for Māori children, they want to be everything, anything up until around the age of seven. And then after the age of seven, something happens that gets them thinking that they're not good enough to be those things anymore. And I think we've got environments, we're in environments where somewhere along the line, there's this message that takes our eyes off what we really want to be and it, it lowers where we're seeing things and so for me I want people to similar to what we said earlier when they see us in these positions they think oh if Vinny can do that if Efesel can do that then so can I and when they see people in different roles whether it's sport whether it's in the academy a range of things what they're seeing constantly is there are people who look like me in those positions so it's very possible I think the key idea for me today is how do we find the right people to walk with them along the journey because it can get quite lonely and if you've got parents who have might not have experienced where you want to go or what you want to do then we've got to find the right adult or mentor who will walk with the child who will walk with that young person to say yeah this is this is not beyond you all we've got to do is just keep believing and I think there's a real belief issue that we have and once we can overcome the belief once we can scaffold around a young person's desire and belief issue then I think we're going to go somewhere far and it's something I deal with too you know, often people say oh you must be really confident hey I'm just as nervous I don't know if you realize this but I'm just as nervous coming to this interview yeah. as well and sometimes I what I enjoy about being on the bus or going for a ride in the car or on the train is it gives me time to try and uh, hold that disbelief eh, where I think, oh, am I good enough or will I fall over and trip over something? And it's enough time for me just to hold it, put it in a little pocket somewhere and remember that I'm okay, that everything I've done up to this point is all right, and yeah. I'm still loved. Hey, I left the house today, my kids said to me, oh, we love you, Dad, and my wife tells me she loves me, and so I'm reminding myself of those things that anchor me, because that's what's going to give me belief. Yeah. You said a key word, and that's love. Mm. A lot of, in a lot of our generation, we, we often don't hear that word. Mm. We are the, we are the too busy with our, with our hectic time schedule of either doing like mahi or, or our friends. We often don't hear it enough within our families. Like I, just this, this morning, I went to go say I love you, sis. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's something that um, I, I truly believe that our kids need to learn to, and to say it normally, yeah. normalize the words I love you, yeah. because then you start to feel that warmth and then you can I always always believe that that, that warmth can be passed to the next yeah. person to the next person yeah, yeah I, I agree can I just say one of the things when we were growing up we because you know we we were playing remember you I joked that Jerry played good at sport and <laughs> I kind of was okay not as nowhere near as good as Jerry but we, I, I did athletics at school and so I did um, shot put javelin and discus <laughs> Yeah, but back then you, there weren't many of us doing it and it was an individual type of sport but I used to I, you know um, sometimes my parents would come remember this is this generation of parents and I'd say to mum oh dad doesn't say well done like I'm just waiting for dad to say oh you know well done oh you're so good and we'd just get in the car and often it was, oh, you know, next time you're, you you got to work on your technique. So everything was improvement based rather than, well, good on you, son. And mum said to me, you know, for, for his generation, in Samoan they say, and that means is the dad doesn't show his love that way. He, he was trying to express his love to me by saying, this is how you improve. But having been born in New Zealand and growing up here, my environment was kind of yearning for, can you just say, well done, son? Because hey, that's what I needed to hear. Yeah. And so today as a father, I'm constantly saying to my daughter, the, the older one in particular, because she's the one playing sport, I say, well done, I'm so proud of you. And I can see how it lifts her, but that's something that I understand today, that it's important that I express my love to her. And I'm but useless. I've got daughters, and you know, Samoan men are around their doors. You give them anything and everything, whatever you want. And so, 
I, uh, I understand that generationally it's maybe shifted that dad was doing his best to show me love through but I could never read it yeah. but now I can I've got the language and I've got the expressions to be able to show my daughters love in a way I think they're looking for it and that's what's really important so yeah saying I love you is cool I think it's amazing definitely I'll, I'll share something with my dad yeah. because my dad was like that far uh, more way yeah, old yeah. school and I, I got, I got this, I got the stare. So I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be like, I'll do something, and I'll be yeah. like, it's a stare, and I'm like, don't do something wrong. <laughs> I look at the teacher, the teacher's going, and I'll be like, okay, I did something right. It was not only like when I was reached to my my young age of twenty nine, <laughs> where he comes up to me and and I was out of the blue and he goes, son, I'm really proud of you. Yeah, nice. You have that moment with him, and you just like you. You don't know how to because he hasn't seen anything like this. Yeah. So, for our generation, and I, especially our generation who needs that love, to hear that from even just from anyone who's out there who's helping us, like a, a, groups like um, going, going back to our, to our main man Sully, you know, he's yeah. he's teaching our kids like that, you know. So it's important for it to be to flourish. Um, so. When we talk about kids, we talk about the adults, and when we talk about the adults, we talk about grandparents. We talk about Auckland as a whole. So we're coming up to our final parts of our conversation, and uh, I always like to leave off with a with our guests to pretty much say a lovely quote at the end of it. So what what words of wisdom or love that you want to send out to those who are in in, in need of those words? Oh, I want. I hope that they know for sure that there are people who are genuinely interested in their lives, interested in the things that they care about, that they want to do. And I hope that people will look at even my candidacy in the mayoralty and believe that we're, we're now wanting to build a just, sustainable and caring society. And we can all be angry. And I think being angry is sometimes the easier option, channeling that anger so that we build and create and love and innovate is going to take real work from everybody, but especially those of us who are like me and you, we're slightly over 20 years old now. I think that response responsibility falls on us to love on people so that we're going to connect and unite people so that's that's why I'm in this eh? and, and all my life that's what I've ever done and I want people to know that this is something I learned in Ōtara this is how we grew up we were financially challenged we you know I'm the youngest of six kids but it was that love and resilience that I learned in my home that I think has prepared me for what I'm doing today. So I'm I'm proud from that I'm from Water. I am 274 hard and I'm committed to seeing that love and nurture and resilience of Water be expressed throughout the whole of our country. Awesome. And I'm just going to leave you with my thought. Oh, yeah. When you talked about being on the bus, it reminds me of a certain situation back in back in England during World War II, the, the start of World War II. Winston Churchill took a subway train. Oh. He took a subway train to get to Parliament. And when he was in that sub subway train, he looked around everyone and he goes, I want to hear your opinion. I want to know what are your thoughts about this? And he heard the people. Oh, I like to imagine you being in that position. Yeah. Sweet. And you are listening to our voices from the youngest to the oldest, mm. from anywhere that needs to hear it, you are hearing it. And I want you to hear our voices loud and clear. Yeah. Thank you once again, Mr. Efeso Collins. I'd like to shake your hand as well, sir. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that is us for today. I hope you feel empowered, enriched, and we'll see you in the next episode. Kia ora.